political community that does not tolerate criticism is very insecure. I always remember on Hyde Park Corner in London, you'd get up on a soapbox and you could criticize God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, His Majesty the King, the Prime Minister, say anything you like. The police would stand by and rub their chins and laugh. But nowadays, uh, in our rather insecure political climate, you have to be increasingly careful what you say, especially in corporations and universities where you might lose your job for being controversial of all things. So if one cannot stand uh, this sort of, uh, I'd call it um, lunatic element or a subversive element or whatever it is, it's certainly it's like, it's like putting spice in a stew. You don't want the whole stew full of spice, but you want just a little bit. It keeps things alive. And so these things have to be tolerated, because otherwise one is suspicious that if you can't tolerate them, you're on the defensive about your own principles. And if you're on the defensive about your own principles, you probably don't believe in them. Uh, we get fanatical about things that don't stand clear examination and positions for which we have no evidence. And I notice again and again that in arguments in the newspaper, letters to the editor and things like that, people who take uh, some types of what you might call reactionary stand will never bring up any evidence. They'll use all sorts of cuss words and loaded terms, but no evidence. So, uh, I think it's a, a, a important, therefore, for an institution of this kind to observe its proper percentage uh, of oddballs and uh, for this reason, to feel uh, free to make experimental investigations into the study of the religious consciousness. Now, uh, uh, such investigations can be of many kinds, uh, ranging from sending uh, giving grants available for people to go to Japan and India and Burma and so on, such places, to enter into uh, religious communities and work along with the uh, monks or members of an ashram and actually partake in the disciplines of what they're doing. That's very important. It's also important, however, to bring other points of view to bear on those sort of disciplines and to provide facilities for neurological and psychiatric study of these disciplines. Uh, it's also important to investigate the connection of these things with things that we know something about already, such as hypnosis. Is Zen meditation self-hypnosis? Well, for heaven's sakes, try and see. Try and see with experiments in hypnosis whether you can get the same results as monks sitting in a, in a, in a monastery. Uh, uh, what happens, uh, what really goes on to people when they control their breath in certain ways? Uh, is there a, a altered consciousness the result of hyperoxygenation? Uh, what is... Um, Loneliness, the hermit, the cell, what has that got to do with sensory deprivation? Uh, get working with the psychology department or whoever else has sensory deprivation equipment and see what happens to you. Uh, oh, what about chemistry, brain chemistry? There's an awful lot to be done in that field. But it's typical that uh, it's practically impossible to carry on that kind of research, uh, except in a very limited way, because there's a panic about it. All scientists in the past were willing to take risks. Lots of them experimented on themselves in ways that would now be considered very dangerous, as we can think of the history of X-rays. Uh, but nevertheless, if they hadn't taken those risks on behalf of the rest of us, we would never have found these things out. Uh, we have a kind of panic for not taking risks. Uh, I know of a high school where the, the, in the auditorium was a great banner over the proscenium arch, which says, safety first in all things. Uh, our children are overprotected. 
When you see children in Japan or Mexico running around all over the place, uh, they're much freer. They play in circumstances that we would consider absolutely deplorable. But part of love is giving those you love the freedom of their own lives. If you are so possessive that you would feel yourself utterly crushed if an accident should happen to your child, it means you are not really loving your child at all. You're merely clutching your child as something that satisfies some need in you, which isn't necessarily love at all. So I do think we've got to be willing to take risks in a line of inquiry which is, after all, quite dangerous. Even nothing is more dangerous than religion, when you really come down to it. Because it is in this sort of, uh, in this domain, as I was saying this morning, that we formulate the key suppositions upon which we act. It is here that we generate common sense. Now take for example, I'm just going to give an illustration, an idea like the following, and then you will realize how dangerous religion could be. Have you ever realized that in the Spanish Inquisition, the inquisitors were the sort of people whom we would regard in this day and age as the most eminent authorities for example, the professor of surgery at a great medical school, or uh, the chief astronomer at Palomar, or a physicist like Oppenheimer. Uh, the inquisitors had that sort of status in their own day and age. And they not merely believed, but they knew that people who suffered from heresy were uh, going to be tortured forever and ever in hell. That wasn't something you merely speculated about. Uh, it was in the current climate of opinion. You knew that that was what was going to happen. And therefore, first of all, out of kindness to these people, they had to be cured of heresy because their immortal souls were in danger. And so when you are up against a danger as extreme as that, any measures will do to achieve your result. And so uh, they invented their own kind of shock treatment. And furthermore, another awful thing about heresy is that it's infectious. And you have to protect the community. I mean, today, imagine, just suppose a bubonic plague got going. What a disturbance there would be about um, cutting it off, isolating communities where this was breaking out. We would really uh, go to it. Now, we say, of course, the... Inquisition was something of the Middle Ages. We don't do things like that anymore. That just is unthinkable today. But let me give you a, a thought. Now, what I'm going to say now is a speculation. It isn't necessarily something which I'm going to defend to the death, but it's just an idea. Supposing it's still going on, right in the middle of this community, only we don't know what we're doing. We don't recognize it. Of course we don't. They didn't recognize it then. The new form of heresy is called mental illness. One school of thought is called schizophrenia. It's rather like Protestantism, it used to be. Uh, there are others, paranoia, uh, megalomania, all sorts of things. Mr. remember, schizophrenia in particular is a very vague word. Nobody really knows what it is. But uh, just entertain for a moment the idea that this is not a disease, but a heresy. It's a way of looking at life which just doesn't agree with other people's impressions. A way of feeling, a way of interpreting experience that is not in accordance with uh, the orthodox kind of experience. One should realize, you see, that experience is not something simply passive. Uh, when we receive experience, it isn't just as if we were photographic plates or mirrors exposed to what is there. Uh, there are approved experiences and disapproved experiences, just as there are approved socially acceptable gestures and gestures that are not socially acceptable. 
So it is with experience. And we are very carefully trained to experience in certain ways. Uh, in other words, there are certain things that we just aren't allowed to feel. And if by any chance these feelings should arise in people, uh, like the typical joke question from a psychiatrist, do you ever have strange feelings? <laughs> uh, then we say the person is in danger of a mental disease. Well now Thomas Sass and others have made a very hard-headed serious critique of the whole idea of using a medical model for behavior and experience variations which are not directly uh, capable of being related to organic damage. And they're saying it's the wrong model. Uh, these people are not sick. They are protesting in some way. They may, in fact, be showing symptoms of a healing process that is going on. And to treat it by trying to get rid of it would be like trying to cure chickenpox by cutting off the spots. Uh, maybe uh, these people are actually uh, going through a painful process through which they are becoming liberated from a collective madness. And indeed, uh, there are indications that the human race is collectively crazy, insofar as it is on a suicide course. And we could think of some other things too. But here is a, here is a hypothesis which could be tested. That when we get a person classified as mentally ill, we put him through a degradation ceremony. He is deprived of civil rights. Uh, and because he's crazy, anything he says will ipso facto be wrong and evidence of craziness. If he doesn't like this and starts to get obstreperous, then further restrictions are put on him. He is put in a solitary way. Eventually, uh, he's trying to communicate. He's trying to say something, uh, and he feels mistrustful of himself because everybody around him doubts him. Finally, he is reduced to being put naked in a padded cell where all he has to express himself with is excrement. And we say, isn't that typical of the sad case that the fellow's in? But it's brought about by the circumstances. It's not the individual. It's the individual in a certain context. A context of total mistrust. All around. One a, a clinical psychologist at uh, a Tascadero State Hospital was saying to me not so long ago, um, he said, you know, people always ask about a, a given person, is he violent? And a person uh, isn't <coughs> violent in the same way uh, quite that um, a flower has five petals. He is violent in a certain context. And in that context, yes, violence will flare up. Um, is he a good husband? Maybe he is, but it also depends a bit on who he's married to. <laughs> uh, it always takes two to make a quarrel. So if instead, you see, of the degradation ceremony and saying, you are sick, uh, immediately there's an encounter, a psychiatric encounter. Uh, the person is a patient. And that means there's something wrong with him. It used to be called wicked, you see, but now it's called sick. But supposing we worked another way, supposing, for the sake of argument, we thought of a person who is experiencing life in an unusual way as um, growing in some direction, but disturbed only because of the resistance of the social environment to this kind of growth. And then we, we got this person into an inter institution where instead of going through a degradation ceremony, he would go through an initiation ceremony. And it would be made perfectly clear that something special was happening and the community is... Something special was happening and the community is here to help him uh, get through it and advance it and explore it.
uh, maybe this is a religious crisis of some kind, spiritual crisis. Uh, but the trouble again is you see that in so many cases, whenever a patient in a mental hospital produces religious communications, then they know he's nuts. <laughs> Especially if it has anything to do with oriental religions or weird things like that. I remember a case of a, a young man in the Air Force uh, who attended a school where I was teaching and he got uh, deeply involved into oriental philosophy and he had a classical uh, awakening experience but it was mighty strong stuff for him and because, but he was in the Air Force and he went AWOL he couldn't care less about going through all these procedures and so on and, and his entire job in the Air Force was some stupid thing it wasn't connected with a plane he never saw a plane it was some kind of um, checking in and out of a desk somewhere well we couldn't handle him because he was the property of the Air Force. And the men in the white coats came along and they took him to hospital. And when he started talking about having studied Oriental philosophy, they just said, oh, no, no, come now. And they put him away. Uh, finally, he was returned to his family and they put him into an institution where he had two years of shock treatment and finally escaped and uh, <laughs> returned to the world uh, as a very creative member of society now engaged in a very important work. Well, there's a hypothesis. But you see how subversive it is. It simply turns things upside down. So far as we're concerned, sane people are most of the And crazy people are, in certain cases, on their way to becoming the same. But you see what an inversion that is. Uh, go back, however, in time, and you see that when the Buddha organized the Sangha, they were all dropouts. And they adopted as their standard costume the yellow robe worn by convicts. And said, well, we feel that the cosmology in which you people believe you're living in, that's the, the order of society and the order of the world, is pure agony, dukkha. Uh, you're trying to solve unreal and illusory problems. You think that by uh, acquiring uh, what you think is security, what you think is happiness, uh, is merely a way of tormenting yourself. And if you're sane at all, you'll, you'll, you'll stop doing it. You'll drop out. Is it, do you, you realize uh, Buddhism in its initial form, as far as one can tell, is a critique of the notion that survival is the supreme good? It's never been proved that it's good to survive. Uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a really a choice whether you want to end up with a bang or a whimper. Some people would say... Uh, it is good when something burns at a slow rate for a long time. That's good. Other people would say, no, 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 that's a bit boring. We want an enormous flash. And that'll be that. Who's right? Uh, that's why lots of people love to do dangerous things. They feel more intensely alive than people who play it careful. So I'm merely putting these suggestions out simply as a way of indicating that the realm of religious inquiry, the realm of investigating our basic, basic assumptions, is a very dangerous adventure. Uh, therefore, many people who uh, carry on these things learn the art of protective coloring. And it is called esotericism. The reason for the esoteric, for a cautious attitude, for not uh, telling everything, only to the initiate sort of thing, is that if the world at large found out what those people were really doing, uh, it would have the screaming meanies. <laughs> and you have to do the same thing. Uh, but uh, do it consciously. That means 
cultivating at the same time as you carry on such inquiries great academic respectability. <laughs> it's immensely important to have people going around in white coats, to have, um, when you do any practical investigations into religion, have plenty of scientific instruments. By all means, get a computer, whether you use it or not. <laughs> uh, because these are magical objects which will protect you in the same way as hex signs. Uh, and uh, always be able to speak the right language. See, that's the trouble. When a person has schizophrenia, he gets into difficulty. The difficulty is he can't talk the right language. Uh, a person who <laughs> is what you might call a successful and adaptive mystic knows how to talk to people uh, in their everyday language. And he doesn't startle them. Uh, except in, say, in Zen circles. Now, why is it when you study Zen that all these dialogues sound so funny? They sound absolutely nutty. Well, uh, Zen masters did not, as a rule, carry on that sort of conversation with people who weren't studying Zen. When you meet these people, they are perfectly ordinary, uh, able to handle the world in a very competent way and relate to anyone. And uh, it's only in the protected environment of the Zen school that there are occasions under which anything goes and you are expected to react to a certain situation without stopping to think. You see, what you're doing, uh, just to illustrate this sort of process, you're learning to trust your own brain. And people who have only learned to think verbally don't trust their brains. They say, wait a minute, I have time to think that out. Which means arrange a word order, or a number order. That's thinking it out. But one of the great difficulties of life is that there isn't time to think things out. Except very trivial things, where uh, an immediate decision is not important. How does one make decisions? Well, you gather a lot of evidence and facts, and a lot of advice. And then you add it all up and you think, well, well, we can knock out this possibility and this possibility, we won't do that. We come down to two things we might do. And the evidence on both sides is that either might be all right and either might be terribly wrong. But just flip a coin. <laughs> uh, we do that all the time because uh, in any human situation, there are always infinitely many non-measurable variables which may uh, upset the best laid plans. You never know. We've, you sign a contract and you rely on this firm and so on, but you don't know the president's not going to slip on a banana skin or have an automobile accident. There's no way of uh, figuring that out. So you flip coins. The Chinese invented a 64-sided coin for flipping, called the Book of Changes. <laughs> uh, I sometimes think it has more possibility than a merely two-sided coin. <laughs> uh, so. The point is here, we do have in the human brain an extraordinary computer uh, which can work at terrific speed and um, come up with some awfully sensible things because after all, it is this brain that regulates the whole homeostasis of the human body which uh, is an astounding organization and the thing that really proves how clever our brains are is that our best neurologists can't understand them. <laughs> so, you, you obviously got to trust your own brain, because if you can't trust your own brain, there's nothing you can trust. So, uh, a lot of these experiments that are being done are experiments in brain trusting. <laughs> in uh, learning to act spontaneously and make instant decisions without hesitation. Uh, it's for this reason that Zen got connected with the practice of Judo. Uh, because in Judo, you've got to act before you think. Because if you stop to think, it's too late. And Judo is not merely building in reflexes. Uh, because you can only build in a certain number of reflexes, and then you wait for an enemy to attack you in a way for which you haven't learned a reflex, and then you're in trouble. Uh, it is actually, uh, as it were, cultivating a kind of complex perception 
and intelligence, which we don't ordinarily exercise in a culture which overvalues thinking. That is to say, using a negotiating life primarily with the aids of words, numbers, and similar symbols. Now, I can put this another way, and you will see in uh, this sort of thing, any of you with any psychological or scientific training will immediately see possibilities for experiments. The thing that has seems to have happened in the development of language is that we've learned to identify ourselves, our ego, with a peculiar and restricted use of perception or conscious attention. When we were little children and we were in the classroom and, you know, we were goofing off and looking all over the place and picking our noses and throwing <laughs> spitballs at people, the teacher would slam the desk and say, pay attention! And all the kids know exactly what to do. They wrap their legs around the leg of the chair and stare at the teacher. Because <laughs> then they look as if they're paying attention. Actually, they're not. <laughs> they're thinking about paying attention but they're not necessarily listening to the lesson. How do you force yourself to listen? Because that's a distraction from listening. <laughs> In order to concentrate, you've got to trust your mind. You've got to let go and let the, let the information come in. I mean, if you want to remember, you've got to simply assume that you will remember instead of hammering the phrases into your head. You assume that you've got a memory. Trust it. So what has happened is something like this, as far as I can see. We've specialized in a form of awareness and attention, which is rather like the scanning process of radar. And we constantly scan our environment. We select those features of the environment that we consider noteworthy, that they have some sort of significance. And for those, we have a notation. See, what is not notable uh, has a notation. Make a note of it. So words are designed to pick out those features of the environment. We have names for the things that we think are noteworthy. Like the tailor who went to see the Pope, and they said, what was he like? Oh, he said he was about a size 40. <laughs> <laughs> Noteworthy to the tailor. Uh, what's important about rabbits? Are they cuddly? Good for fur coats? Or for um, stewed rabbit, you see? It's how whether you're a cook or a furrier or a child looking at the thing. So, quite obviously, we see, we perceive an enormous number of things that we don't notice. If you're a husband and you go out to some meeting and the lady is there and you go back home and your wife says, was Mrs. So-and-so there? You said, yes, I was talking to her. Well, what was she wearing? You haven't the faintest idea. You saw, but you didn't notice. So, as a result of this, you see, we are using a restricted consciousness. And we say, as a result of using that, you can only think of one thing at a time. Uh, well, one thing at a time is too slow. Most people cannot deal with more than three variables without using a pencil. Uh, you learn something more than that when you start playing the organ and you've got two keyboards and you've got different rhythms going for each hand and another rhythm going for each foot. See, you're beginning to loosen up a bit then. Uh, uh, you were becoming unrigid. But uh, there are all sorts of critical things happening all the time uh, on which we have to decide so suddenly that there's no time to think in the ordinary way. But we can, many people are somehow peculiarly gifted at acting intelligently under such circumstances. Because uh, you're more intelligent than you think. <laughs> So, uh, this sort of inquiry uh, means, when I say a scientific 
approach to nonverbal intelligence, non-symbolic intelligence. That's what's called, uh, that, that's the whole point in uh, Buddhistic, Taoistic, and a great deal of Hindu practice uh, is called the state of jhana, uh, which is the attitude of observing the environment, both the interior environment of the organism and the external environment of nature, without thinking about it. Now, uh, <coughs> ordinarily, you see, this sounds like stupidity. But it's only by thinking that I can say, I'm different from you. A baby knows uh, you're no more different from me than my head is different from my feet. Well, sure, the feet is uh, different from the head because uh, it's all one body, but the body polarizes itself in different aspects. But uh, my experience of you is a state of my nervous system. I know you by digesting you neurologically. <laughs> you know me the same way, it's mutual. Uh, so the, different, the, the separateness of things is conceptual. And it's necessary to suspend concepts. This is very important academically, because you can get to the point where a library is nothing but a self-breeding concept machine in which books are about books are about books are about books are about books. It's sort of disintegrating like a great cheese. It has mitosis. And uh, so you, these poor PhD students are grubbing around, uh, writing volumes about other volumes, and they're making condensations of it. See, this is one of the great problems in information theory. Uh, in certain fields of science, so much information is coming out that nobody can possibly read it. And so you have to make digests. And that means later digests of digests. And then where are we going to store the stuff? Well, we've got to have microfilms and new kinds of miniaturization of, of data. We should call it captor rather than data. Um, but what about it? Well, the difficulty in that is not only it's becoming unmanageable, and again, the difficulty of thought coping with something that requires speed, but also that it's be slowly moving away from reality. By reality, I mean what we call the physical world. And consequently, it's exactly the same situation as if I never stop talking. If I do that, you see, um, I never hear what anybody else has to say. Now, it's the same problem for a person who never stops thinking. He never has anything to think about except thinking. You've got to stop thinking. 